By fires of highland driftwood, pale as bone, they crouched in silence while the flames yawed and the night winds ascending those stony draws. The kid sat with his legs crossed, mending a strap with an awl he'd borrowed from the ex-priest Tobin, and the frockless one looked on as he worked. You've done this afore, said Tobin. The kid wiped his nose with a swipe of his greasy sleeve and turned the piece in his lap. Not me, he said. Well, you've the knack, more so than me. There's little equity in the Lord's gifts. The kid looked up at him and then bent to his work again. That's so, said the ex-priest. Look around you. Study the judge. I done studied him. Mayhaps he ain't to your liking, fair enough, but the man's a hand at anything. I've never seen him turn to a task, but what he didn't prove clever at it. The kid drove the greased thread through the leather and hauled it taut. He speaks Dutch, said the ex-priest. Dutch? Aye. The kid looked at the ex-priest. He bent to his mending. He does, for I heard him do it. We cut a parcel of crazy pilgrims down off the Lano, and the old man in the lead of them, he spoke right up in Dutch, like we were all of us in Dutchland, and the judge give him right back. Glanton come near falling off his horse. We none of us knew him to speak it. Asked where he learned it, you know what he said? What did he say? Said off a Dutchman. The ex-priest spat. I couldn't have learned it off ten Dutchmen. What about you? The kid shook his head. No, said Tobin. The gifts of the Almighty are weighed and parceled out in a scale peculiar to himself. It's no fair accountant, and I don't doubt but what he'd be the first to admit it, and you put the query to him boldface. Who? The Almighty, the Almighty. The ex-priest shook his head. He glanced across the fire toward the judge that great, hairless thing. You wouldn't think to look at him that he could outdance the devil himself, now would you? God, the man is a dancer. You'll not take that away from him. And fiddle. He's the greatest fiddler I ever heard, and that's an end on it. The greatest. He can cut a trail, shoot a rifle, ride a horse, track a deer. He's been all over the world. Him and the governor, they sat up till breakfast, and it was Paris this and London that in five languages. You'd have given something to have heard of him. The governor's a learned man himself, he is, but the judge... The ex-priest shook his head. Oh, it may be the Lord's way of showing how little store he sets by the learned. Whatever could it mean to one who knows all? He's an uncommon love for the common man and godly wisdom resides in the least of things, so that it may well be that the voice of the Almighty speaks most profoundly in such beings as lives in silence themselves. He watched the kid. For let it go how it will, he said. God speaks in the least of creatures. The kid thought him to mean birds or things that crawl, but the ex-priest, watching, his head slightly cocked, said, no man is give leave of that voice. The kid spat into the fire and bent to his work. I ain't heard no voice, he said. When it stops, said Tobin, you'll know you've heard it all your life. Is that right? Aye. The kid turned the leather in his lap. The ex-priest watched him. At night, said Tobin, when the horses are grazing and the company is asleep, who hears them grazing? Don't nobody hear them if they're asleep. Aye, and if they cease their grazing, who is it that wakes? Every man. Aye, said the ex-priest, every man. The kid looked up. And the judge, does the voice speak to him? The judge, said Tobin. He didn't answer. I seen him before, said the kid, in Nacogdoches. Tobin smiled. 
Every man in the company claims to have encountered that sooty sold rascal in some other place. Tobin rubbed his beard on the back of his hand. He saved us all. I have to give him that. We come down off the little Colorado. We didn't have a pound of powder in the company. Pound. We'd not a dram, hardly. There he sat on a rock in the middle of the greatest desert you'd ever want to see. Just perched on this rock like a man waiting for a coach. Brown thought him a mirage. Might have shot him for one if he'd had aught to shoot him with. How come you'd have no powder? Shot it all up at the savages. Holed up nine days in a cave, lost most of the horses. We were thirty-eight men when we left Chihuahua City, and we were fourteen when the judge found us. Mortally whipped, on the run. Every man jack of us knew that in that godforsook land somewhere was a draw or a cul-de-sac or perhaps just a pile of rocks, and there we'd be driven to a stand with those empty guns. The judge. Give the devil his due. The kid held the tack in one hand, the awl in the other. He watched the ex-priest. We'd been on the plane all night and well up into the next day. The Delawares kept calling halts and dropping to the ground to give a listen. There was no place to run and no place to hide. I don't know what they wanted to hear. We knew the bloody niggers was out there, and speaking for myself, that was already an abundance of information. I didn't need more. That sunrise we'd looked to be our last. We were all watching the backtrack. I don't know how far you could see, fifteen, twenty miles. Then about the meridian of that day, we come upon the judge on his rock there in that wilderness by his single self. Now, there was no rock, just the one. Irving said he'd brung it with him. I said that it was a mere stone, for to mark him out of nothing at all. He had with him that selfsame rifle you see with him now, all mounted in German silver, and the name that he'd give it set with silver wire under the check piece in Latin. Et in Arcadia Ego. A reference to the lethal in it. Common enough for a man to name his gun. I've heard Sweet Lips and Hark from the Tombs and every sort of lady's name. His is the first and only ever I seen with an inscription from the classics. And there he sat. No horse. Just him and his legs crossed, smiling as we rode up, like he'd been expecting us. He'd an old canvas kit bag and an old woolen Benjamin over the one shoulder. In the bag was a brace of pistols and a good assortment of specie, gold and silver. He didn't even have a canteen. It was like you couldn't tell where he'd come from. Said he'd been with a wagon company and fell out to go it alone. Davy wanted to leave him there. Didn't set well with his honor, and it don't to this day. Glanton just studied him. It was a day's work to even guess what he made of that figure on that ground. I don't know to this day. They've a secret commerce, some terrible covenant. You mind, you'll see I'm right. He called for the last of two pack animals we had, and he cut the straps and left the wallets to lay where they fell, and the judge mounted up, and he and Glanton rode side by side, and soon they was conversing like brothers. The judge sat that animal barebacked like an Indian, and rode with his grip and his rifle perched on the withers, and he looked about him with the greatest satisfaction in the world, as if everything had turned out just as he planned, and the day could not have been finer. We had not rode far before he struck us a new course, about nine points to the east. He pointed out a range of mountains maybe thirty miles distant, and we pulled for those mountains, and none of us asked what for. By then Glanton had given the particulars of the situation in which he'd installed himself, but if being naked of arms in that wilderness and half of all Apacheria in pursuit worried him at all, he kept it to himself entire. The ex-priest had paused to rekindle his pipe, reaching into the raw fire for a coal, as did the Red Scouts, and then setting it back among the flames as if it had a proper place there.
Now, what do you reckon it was in them mountains that we set out for? And how did he come to know of it? How to find it? How to put it to use? Tobin seemed to frame these questions to himself. He was regarding the fire and pulling on his pipe. How indeed, he said. We reached the foothills in the early evening and rode up a dry arroyo and pushed on, I guess, till midnight and made camp with neither wood nor water. Come morning, we could see them on the plain to the north, maybe ten mile out. They were riding four and six abreast, and there was no short supply of them, and they were in no hurry. The judge had been up all night, by what the vedette said, watching the bats. He would go up the side of the mountain and make notes in a little book, and then he would come back down. Couldn't have been more cheerful. Two men had deserted in the night, and that made us down to twelve and the judge thirteen. I gave him my best study, the judge, then and now. He appeared to be a lunatic, and then not. Glanton, I always knew, was mad. We left out with the first light up a little wooded draw. We were on the north slope, and there was willow and alder and cherry growing out of the rock, just little trees. The judge would stop to botanize, and then ride to catch up, my hand to God, pressing leaves into his book. Sure, I never saw the equal to it, and all the time the savages in plain view below us, riding on that pan. God, I'd put a crick in my neck, I couldn't keep my eyes off of them, and they were a hundred souls if they were one. We come out on some flinty ground where it was all juniper, and we just went on. No attempt to put their trackers at fault. We rode all that day. We saw no more of the savages, for they were come under the lee of the mountain and were somewhere on the slopes below us. As soon as it was dusk and the bats was about, the judge, he altered our course again, riding along, holding onto his hat, looking up at the little animals. We got broke up and scattered all in the junipers, and we halted to regroup and to recruit the horses. We sat around in the dark. No one spoke a word. When the judge got back, he and Glanton whispered among themselves, and then we moved on. We led the horses in the dark. There was no trail, just steep, scrabbly rock. When we reached the cave, some of the men thought that he meant for us to hide there, and that he was, for a fact, daft altogether. But it was the nighter. The nighter, you see. We left all that we owned at the mouth of that cave, and we filled our wallets and panniers and our mochilas with the cave dirt, and we left out at daybreak. When we topped the rise above that place and looked back, there was a great spout of bats being sucked down into the cave, thousands of the creatures. And they continued so for an hour or more, and even then it was just that we could no longer see them. The judge. We left him at a high pass, a little Clearwater Creek, him and one of the Delawares. He told us to circle the mountain and to return to that place in forty-eight hours. We unloaded all the containers onto the ground, and took the two horses with us, and him and the Delaware commenced lugging the panniers and the wallets up that little creek. I watched him go, and I said that I would never set eyes on that man again. Tobin looked at the kid. Never in this world. I thought Glanton would leave him. We went on. The next day, on the far side of the mountain, we encountered the two lads that had deserted us, hanging upside down in a tree. They had been skinned, and I can tell you, it does very little for a man's appearance. But if the savages hadn't guessed it already, now they knew for sure that we'd none of us any powder. We would not ride the animals, just lead them, keep them off the rocks, hold their noses if they snuffled. But in those two days the judge leached out the guano with creek water and wood ash, and precipitated it out, and he built a clay kiln and burned charcoal in it, doused the fire by day, and fired it again come dark. When we found him, him and the Delaware were setting in the creek stark naked, and they appeared at first to be drunk, and 
but on what none could surmise. The entire top of that mountain was covered with Apache Indians, and there said he. He got up when he seen us, and went to the willows, and come back with a pair of wallets, and in one was about eight pounds of pure crystal saltpeter, and in the other about three pounds of fine alder charcoal. He'd ground the charcoal to a powder in the hollow of a rock. You could have made ink of it. He lashed the bags shut and put them across the pommel of Glanton's saddle. And him and the Indian got their clothes, and I was glad of it, for I never seen a grown man with not a hair to his body and him weighing twenty-four stone, which he did then and does now, and by my own warrant. For I added up the counters on the bar with my own and sober eyes at a stock scale in Chihuahua City in that same month and year. We went down the mountain with no scouts, nothing, just straight out. We were dead for sleep. It was dark when we reached the plain, and we grouped and took a head count, and then we rode out. The moon was about three-quarters full and waxing, and we were like circus riders, not a sound, the horses on eggshells. We'd no way of knowing where the savages was. The last clue we'd had of their vicinity was the poor buggers flayed in the tree. We set out dead west across the desert. Doc Irving was before me, and it was that bright I could count the hairs on his head. We rode all night, and toward the morning, just as the moon was down, we come upon a band of wolves. They scattered and come back. Not a sound out of them, no more than smoke. They drift off and quarter around and circle the horses, bold as brass. We cut at them with our hobbles, and they would slip past. You couldn't hear them on the hard pan, just their breath, or they would mutter and grouse or pop their teeth. Glanton halted, and the thing swirled around and slank off and come back. Two of the Delawares backtracked off to the left a bit, braver souls than me, and sure, they found the kill. "'Twas a young buck antelope newly killed the evening before. "'It was about half consumed, and we set upon it with our knives "'and took the rest of the meat with us, and we ate it raw in the saddle, "'and it was the first meat we'd seen in six days. "'Froze for it we were, foraging on the mountain for pinion nuts like bears, "'and glad to get them. "'We left little more than bones for the lobos.' But I would never shoot a wolf, and I know other men of the same sentiments. In all this time the judge had spoke hardly a word. So at dawn we were on the edge of a vast malpais, and his honor takes up a position on some lava rocks there, and he commences to give us a address. It was like a sermon, but it was no such sermon as any man of us had ever heard before. Beyond the Malpais was a volcanic peak, and in the sunrise it was many colors, and there was dark little birds crossing down the wind, and the wind was flapping the judge's old Benjamin about him, and he pointed to that stark and solitary mountain and delivered himself of an oration to what end I know not, then or now. And he concluded with telling us that our mother the earth, as he said, was round like an egg and contained all good things within her. Then he turned and led the horse he had been riding across that terrain of black and glassy slag, treacherous to man and beast alike, and us behind him like the disciples of a new faith. The ex-priest broke off and tapped the dead pipe against the heel of his boot. He looked at the judge over the way where he sat with his torso bared to the flames, as was his practice. He turned and regarded the kid. The Malpais. It was a maze. Ye'd run out upon a little promontory, and ye'd be balked about by the steep crevasses. Ye wouldn't dare to jump them. Sharp black glass the edges, and sharp the flinty rocks below. We led the horses with every care, and still they were bleeding about their hooves. Our boots was cut to pieces. Clambering over those old caved and rimpled plates, you could see well enough how things had gone in that place. Rocks melted and set up all wrinkled like a pudding. The earth stove through to the molten core of her.
Where, for aught any man knows, lies the locality of hell? For the earth is a globe in the void, and truth there is no up nor down to it. And there's men in this company besides myself seen little cloven hoofprints in the stone, clever as a little doe in her going. But what little doe ever tried melted rock? I'd not go behind Scripture, but it may be that there has been sinners so notorious evil that the fires coughed them up again. And I could well see in the long ago how it was little devils with their pitchforks had traversed that fiery vomit for to salvage back those souls that had by misadventure been spewed up from their damnation onto the outer shelves of the world. Aye, it's a notion no more. But some place in the scheme of things this world must touch the other. And something put them little hooflet markings in the lava flow for I seen them there myself. The judge, he seemed not to take his eyes from that dead cone, where it rose off the desert like a great chanker. We followed solemn as owls, so that he turned to look back, and he did laugh when he seen our faces. At the foot of the mountain we drew lots, and we sent two men to go on with the horses. I watched them go. One of them is at this fire tonight and I saw him lead them horses away over the slaglands like a doomed man. And we were not doomed ourselves, I don't reckon. When I looked up, he was already upon the slope, hand and foot, the judge was, his bag over his shoulder and his rifle for Alpenstock. And so did we all go. Not halfway up we could already see the savages out on the plain. We climbed on. I thought at worst we'd throw ourselves into the cauldron rather than be taken by those fiends. We climbed up, and I reckon it was midday when we reached the top. We were done in. The savage is not ten miles out. I looked at the men about me, and sure, they didn't look much. The dignity was gone out of them. They were good hearts all, then and now, and I did not like to see them so, and I thought the judge had been sent among us for a curse. And yet he proved me wrong. At the time he did. I'm of two minds again now. He was the first to the rim of the cone for all the size of him, and he stood gazing about like he'd come for the view. Then he sat down, and he began to scale at the rock with his knife. One by one we straggled up, and he sat with his back to that gaping hole, and he was chipping away, and he called upon us to do the same. It was brimstone, a wheel of brimstone all about the rim of the cauldron, bright yellow, and shining here and there with the little flakes of silica, but most pure flowers of sulfur. We chipped it loose and chopped it fine with our knives till we had about two pounds of it, and then the judge took the wallets and went to a cupped place in the rock, and dumped out the charcoal and the niter, and stirred them about with his hand, and poured the sulfur in them. I didn't know but what we'd be required to bleed into it like Freemasons, but it wasn't so. He worked it up dry with his hands, and all the while the savages down there on the plain draw nigh to us. And when I turned back, the judge was standing, the great hairless oaf, and he took out his pizzle, and he was pissing into the mixture pissing with a great vengeance, and one hand aloft, and he cried out for us to do likewise. We were half mad anyways, all lined up, Delawares and all, every man save Glanton, and he was a study. We hauled forth our members, and at it we went, and the judge on his knees kneading the mass with his naked arms, and the piss was splashing about, and he was crying out to us to piss, man, piss for your very souls, for can't you see the redskins yonder? And laughing the while, and working up this great mass in a foul black dough, a devil's batter by the stink of it, and him not a bloody dark pastryman himself, I don't suppose. And he pulls out his knife, and he commences to trowel it across the south-facing rocks, spreading it out thin with a knife blade, and watching the sun with one eye, and him smeared with blacking and reeking of piss and sulfur, and grinning and wielding the knife with a dexterity that was wondrous, like he did it every day of his life.
and when he was done, he sat back and wiped his hands on his chest, and then he watched the savages, and so did we all. They were on the Mont Pais by then, and they had a tracker who followed us every step on that naked rock, fallen back at each blind head and calling out to the others. I don't know what he followed. Scent, perhaps. We could soon hear them talking down there. Then they seen us. Well, God in his glory knows what they thought. They were scattered out across the lava, and one of them pointed, and they all looked up. Thunderstruck, no doubt, to see eleven men perched on the topmost rim of that scalded atoll like misflown birds. They parlayed, and we watched to see would they dispatch any of their number after the horses, but they didn't. Their greed overcame all else, and they started for the base of the cone, scrambling over the lava for to see who would be first. We had, I would suppose, an hour. We watched the savages, and we watched the judges' foul matrix drying on the rocks, and we watched a cloud that was making for the sun. One by one we give up watching the rocks or the savages either one, for the cloud did look to be dead set for the sun, and it would have took the better part of an hour to have crossed it, and that was the last hour we had. Well, the judge was sitting making entries in his little book, and he saw the cloud same as every other man, and he put down the book and watched it, and we did all. No one spoke. There was none to curse and none to pray. We just watched and that cloud just cut the corner from the sun and passed on, and there was no shadow fell upon us, and the judge took up his ledger and went on with his entries as before. I watched him. Then I clambered down and tested a patch of the stuff with my hand. There was heat coming off of it. I walked along the rim, and the savages was ascending by every quarter, for there was no route to favor on that bald and gravel slope. I looked for rocks of any size to send down, but there was none there larger than your fist, just fine gravel and plates of scrag. I looked at Glanton, and he was watching the judge, and he seemed to have had his wit stole. Well, the judge closed up his little book and took his leather shirt and spread it out in the little cupped place and called for us to bring the stuff to him. Every knife was out, and we went to scraping it up, and him cautioning us not to strike fire on them flints. And we heaped it up in the shirt, and he commenced to chop and grind it with his knife. And Captain Glanton, he calls out. Captain Glanton, would you believe it? Captain Glanton, he says. Come charge that swivel bore of yours, and let's see what manner of thing we have here. Glanton come up with his rifle, and he scooped his charger full, and he charged both barrels, and patched two balls, and drove them home, and capped the piece, and made to step to the rim. But that was never the judge's way. Down the maw of that thing, he says, and Glanton never questioned it. He went down the pitch of the inner rim to where lay the terminus of that terrible flu, and he held his piece out over it and pointed it straight down and cocked the hammer and fired. You wouldn't hear a sound like it in a long day's ride. It give me the fidgets. He fired both barrels, and he looked at us, and he looked at the judge. The judge just waved and went on with his grinding. And then he called us all about to fill our horns and flasks. And we did, one by one, circling past him like communicants. And when all had shared, he filled his own flask, and he got out his pistols and saw to the priming. The foremost of the savages was not more than a furlong on the slope. We were ready to lay into them, but again the judge wouldn't have it. He fired off his pistols down into the cauldron, spacing out the shots, and he fired all ten chambers and cautioned us back from sight while he reloaded the pieces. All this gunfire had given the savages some pause, no doubt, for they very likely reckoned us to be without powder altogether. And then the judge, he steps up to the rim, and he had with him a good white linen shirt from out of his bag, and he waved it to the redskins, and he called down to them in Spanish. Well, 
it would have brought tears to your eyes. All dead save me, he called. Have mercy on me. Todos muertos. Todos. Waving the shirt. God had set them yapping on the slope like dogs. And he turns to us, the judge, with that smile of his, and he says, Gentlemen, that was all he said. He had the pistol stuck in his belt at the back, and he drew them one in each hand, and he is as either-handed as a spider. He can write with both hands at a time, and I've seen him to do it. And he commenced to kill Indians. We needed no second invitation. God, it was a butchery. At the first fire, we killed a round dozen, and we did not let up. Before the last poor nigger reached the bottom of the slope, there was fifty-eight of them lay slaughtered among the gravels. They just slid down the slope like chaff down a hopper. Some turned this way, some that, and they made a chain about the base of the mountain. We rested our rifle barrels on the brimstone, and we shot nine more on the lava where they ran. It was a stand, what it was. Wages was laid. The last of them shot was a reckonable part of a mile from the muzzles of the guns, and that on a dead run. It was sharp shooting all around, and not a misfire in the batch with that queer powder. The ex-priest turned and looked at the kid. And that was the judge. First I ever saw him. Aye, he's a thing to study. The kid looked at Tobin. What's he a judge of, he said. What's he a judge of? What's he a judge of? Tobin glanced off across the fire. Ah, lad, he said, hush now. The man'll hear you. His ears like a fox.